there we go. Thanks, Tiana. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you all of you for joining in this evening. I know that as a parent, uh, the last thing you probably want to do is hop on Zoom and use your brain. Um, most people want to just lounge out. So I appreciate you taking the time to be here tonight and hopefully I keep you on your toes. We're going to have an interactive presentation today. So I'm going to actually share the screen with you um, <clears throat> before we continue. Oops. Actually, different slide. There we go. Okay. So the way we're going to do this presentation is um, there are questions that I will be asking you to partake in. These are actual activities and games that we do with the kids themselves. So you get a little bit of a taste of how we introduce particular types of content. For the games, I will have you either use your the hand function so you can raise your hand through Zoom, or you can type the answer that you think, or you can just guess it in your head. In terms of questions, uh, what I'll do is if you could kindly type down your question, uh, if you feel like you can't remember it, type down your question in the chat box, and then uh, at the end of the presentation is when we'll take the, the answers for that. So without further ado, we're going to talk about cyber safety and something called sexual exploitation today. And as Deanna very uh, pleasantly explained, we are an agency called C. And so a few piece of information about us, we are the first in BC to be on the Ministry of Education's website approved for our programs, for educational programs. And we do meet core curriculum competencies. So that's just a little bonus there. We provide trainings for adults like yourselves, and uh, we also do consulting services. So I will be sharing with you a little bit of a research project that we recently did where we looked at predators online behind the scenes. One last thing that I just forgot to mention is I'm getting over a cold. <laughs> so I might start to have a coughing fit. If I do, I will have my lozenges with me. But aside from that, we should be good to go. One thing I do want to talk about before we truly define sexual exploitation is that we actually use the term in many different ways. So there are different types of sexual exploitation. Many times we refer to situations like sexual assault or pressures with sexting or sextortion or online luring by predators or child pornography or human trafficking. These are actually many times forms of sexual exploitation. In terms of the actual definition, it is a law in Canada, which states that it is illegal for somebody under the age of 18 to exchange a sexual act for something in return. So essentially what we see is if somebody is being manipulated, convinced, or forced into exchanging a sexual act for something in return. So that exchange, if you're under 18, is illegal regardless of whether you believe that you are consenting or not. It's, of course, never the fault of the minor who is engaging because legally they are unable to consent. One very important piece to this law and to this crime is that unlike other youth-related issues or child-related issues, this particular one benefits the victim in some way. So when we think about the exchange of a sexual act for something in return, that something in return is actually a type of need. So it, it essentially implies that the victimized party is receiving some sort of benefit. And again, it is exploitative, but the benefit that the victimized party receives is different types of needs that they may have. So exchanging a sexual act for a need like money, exchanging a sexual act for needs like popularity or safety or acceptance or shelter. So again, that exchange brings in something for that victim, which makes this very complicated because a lot of times youth will believe that they are consenting and that they are making the ultimate decision when in fact they have been manipulated or coerced by somebody else. I always like to point to Maslow's hierarchy of needs because when we typically talk about vulnerable youth, the, the kids who are most vulnerable to any kind of issue, we almost rely on this Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We say that the youth who are really lacking their most basic necessities are the most at risk and most vulnerable because they're in survival mode. And then after that comes the kids who are lacking their safety and security needs. And then it's the emotional needs. And so when we take this and we look at the standard vulnerable groups of kids, 
this is typically what we talk about. It's kids who are from lower income families, who are in foster care, who um, have developmental disabilities, are I, I, um, identify as LGBTQ2 plus youth, have mental health barriers. Unfortunately, we know that indigenous youth are very much overrepresented with this issue. Now, this is of course very true. However, most of sexual exploitation, in fact, 90% of it, is now being started online. And so we have to stop and think, when it comes to the internet, when it comes to the digital space, what kind of needs are kids getting from there? And we do think about it, typically speaking, it's not just kids, it's even adults. The needs that you try and get met online are the higher level needs, like uh, you know, the, the self-esteem or the belonging, the validation, the self-actualization, the identity that you're trying to create. So Maslow's hierarchy of needs is flipped upside down or online. And this is where we start to see, and, and it's very much re reflected in the statistics that we're having these days, is that any kind of kid from any background, from any gender, from any sexual orientation, from any status, is equally at risk online of being sexually exploited because all of them are trying to get their higher needs met digitally. So again, the person whose fault it is that is sexually exploiting is called an exploiter. It's not the fault of the youth, it's the fault of the exploiter. Most of the time when we hear about child predators in the news or child predation, we're actually talking about somebody who is an exploiter and sexually exploiting. And exploiters can be anybody of any age, of any kind of relationship. It can even be youth themselves. So we're going to go into our very first game here. Uh, this is what I do with the kids in our cyber safe presentation. So I'm going to test you on your knowledge about predators. And we're going to start off with an international statistic, and then we're going to get into Canadian statistics. So we got three questions here, multiple choice on predators, and we're going to test your knowledge. So let's get started. How many predators are online at any given time looking to connect with minors? How many predators are online at any given time looking to connect with minors? So if you think it's A, 700,000, and if you're able to, raise your hand. If you think it's B, and you're able to, raise your hand. If you think it's C and you're able to raise your hand, 150,000. Okay, and if you think it's D, 200,000, raise your hand. Okay, so most people are saying, and you're actually not off from what the kids tend to say as well. So the answer is 700,000. And what I like to say to the kids and, and point out to the kids because they go, wow, 700,000. I say, no, no, this is not saying there are 700,000 predators. This is saying of the predators that exist out there, 700,000 of them will be online at any given time to connect with minors, right? So pretty big, pretty big number. Next question for you. This is Canadian. What age group do these online predators target the most? What age group do these predators target the most. So if you think it's A, 14 to 17, put your hand up. Okay, if you think it's B, 12 to 13, put your hand up. Okay, if you think it's C, eight to nine, put your hand up. If you think it's D, five to 10, put your hand up. Okay, so we're split between B and D. And again, you're actually very in line with what the kids tend to guess as well. It's 14 to 17. So while we say child predator and we think of children, and of course that does happen, when we look at online predators, who's on the digital space more? Who's on social media apps more? It's the teens. So it's actually the older age group that gets targeted the most. And last question for you, what is the average age of a Canadian predator? the average age of a Canadian predator. So if you think it's A, put your hand up. If you think it's B, put your hand up. If you think it's a lot of you, 
If you think it's C, put your hand up. Okay, and if you think it's D, put your hand up. Okay, so we got diverse answers there. So the average age of a Canadian predator is 24. And whether or not you voted for this, you probably did not have an image of a younger person. Uh, typically, when we say the word predator, and, and even to this day, this is the image that I have in my head, we think of somebody who's older, who's a male, who looks creepy, and maybe they have, you know, the, the predator stash, and maybe they are lurking in the playground or in the basement and they're wearing a white t-shirt and they have the Cheeto stains on there and they drive a white van. And so what, what I point out to the kids, and I think this is something that we have to recognize as well, is that most predatory people, not all, but most of them have been predatory. It's just a part of who they are. So when we think about, or when we see an older person who is creepy looking that gets charged with sexual predation, we have to recognize that most likely that person was predatory their whole lives, including when they were in high school, when they graduated, and as they moved along. And so when we talk about predators, we're just talking about predatory people, predatory behaviors. So with this, we're going to go into our second game, second activity called Two Truths and a Lie. And I'm going to show you a picture of somebody with information about them. And I want you to guess which one is the lie. So let's get started. This is Austin Jones, real person, by the way. I'm not making his name or his face up. This is Austin Jones. So we have Austin Jones is a famous YouTube star. Austin Jones won an award for best hair at his high school. Austin Jones used the crushes from underage female fans to get child pornography from them. So think to yourself which one you think is the lie. So if you think it's the first one, put your hand up. I guess we'll do it that way. If you think it's the first one, put your hand up. Okay, if you think it's the second one, put your hand up. And the third one, put your hand up. So the lie is the hair <laughs> and kids seem to not like his hair. So this is what he looks like now, by the way, um, shift there from his previous look. And this was only a couple of years later. So Austin Jones was this very viral, famous YouTube singer star, and he was 25 years old at the time. And so what he does is he has a lot of underage female fans who are 14, 15 years old, and he would have conversations, private conversations with some of them. And with those, he would essentially say, you know, if you want to really prove that you're my biggest fan, send me some videos, send me some photos of yourself. And oftentimes these were very inappropriate. So by definition, he was a predator and he got charged as one. Second story, this is James Carno. We have James Carno's from BC. James Carno pretended to be a paintball coach to sexually assault boys. And James Carno groomed 10 females. So think for a second, which one you think is the lie? And the answer is that he did not groom 10 females, he groomed 10 males. So this is a great story to share with the kids. It's a little bit older, but what's really great about it is that it, it really pinpoints that sexual predation is not about a gender or a sexual orientation. Um, it's about power. So James Carno is from BC. He's actually from Coquitlam, but he goes on Call of Duty and he starts playing video games with this one boy who from his username, he finds him on Facebook and sees that the boy loves to play paintball. So he comes back on the video game and casually mentions that he is a paintball coach. The boy thinks that's really cool, so he connects him with his nine other friends. And now you have 10 boys playing Call of Duty with James Carno. A few weeks down the road, James says, you know, I want to show my appreciation for our friendship. Why don't you guys come out? I will pay for your paintball games. I'll give you coaching tips. And so the parents of these boys would drive them to meet James Cardno in person. And so many times they would watch their children play with James. And then down the road again, he says, you know, let's do something even greater together. I'm going to invite you all up on this overnight trip up north. And uh, we're going to have a really great time playing baseball. So one of the parents had a gut feeling about this and uh, called the police. 
And long story short, the police were able to get a search warrant and they found in his house on his laptop child pornography of the boys that he had sexually been abusing for 10 years. And what's amazing about the story is that they actually charged him the night before he was going to take these boys up to Kelowna. So that was, that was very good timing. Last one. This is Marcus Hyde. So we have Marcus Hyde is a famous photographer for celebrities. Marcus Hyde is a wannabe photographer who pretended to shoot models. Or Marcus Hyde sexually assaulted and exploited aspiring models. So I'll give you a second to think which one is the lie. So Marcus Hyde is actually a famous celebrity photographer. That's Kim Kardashian. He also shot Ariana Grande and other famous celebrities. And so what he does using his fame and being a fairly young guy is he goes on Instagram. He seeks out the women who were aspiring models or who seemed like they wanted to be these influencers. And he would message them and say that typically it costs him thousands of dollars to do a photo shoot, but because he sees potential in them, he would love to take a, take photos of them for free. And so the girls would meet up with him. He would intoxicate them with alcohol, sexually assault them, and then say afterwards that if they ever told anyone, this is just how the industry works and nobody would believe them. So of course the girls didn't listen to him. They actually screenshotted their conversations that they had that were inappropriate. Um, and he got charged with sexual exploitation. So all these examples, again, to demonstrate that anybody can be predatory, we just define them by their behaviors. I'm going to take a lozenge just because <clears throat> I feel a cough coming on. So why is the internet a jackpot? Um, and, and I mean, we all know this, but I think just to really facilitate it out, back in our day, back in my day, back in your day, there was no social media. And so what our predators had to do to meet us in person uh, was to go somewhere where we hung out. So let's say the mall. And they'd have to wait for us to cross their paths. And when we did, when they approached us, they would have to know the exact right thing to say and the exact person to be in that moment to form a connection with us. So of course, it requires a lot of skill set to do that. And the modern day predator can use that tactic. Or they can also go on an app like Snapchat that has over 300 million users internationally. So they can prey around the world from the palm of their hand, or if they want, they can also set their location settings to their area and prey locally. And then without any work or effort, they just mass copy paste the same text message or they mass friend request and they sit back to see who takes the bait. And when somebody does, they don't have to work hard at knowing what to say because our personalities are already out there for them. So it's just so much easier. But then you have the dynamics from the other end, the other side of things. <clears throat> when it comes to kids and language, we've actually shifted our language when it comes to the digital space. So we've rebranded strangers as friends and followers. If we consider that language shifts our behaviors, and the people that we're talking to online is considered a friend or a follower, then you can imagine how much more casual these conversations are and how much more our guard is down. Then you have the concept that when we're behind a screen, we feel more safe. But why is that? And the reason is that we falsely define danger as just being physical. So we go, if there's a bear in the room, of course I'm in danger. But if the bear is in the screen, there's no way that it can get me. And when it comes to predatory people, what we are seeing is that there can be danger digitally. And we'll look at, at a situation of that later. The last one is that our gut feeling, which is our survival mechanism, is almost difficult to have when we're online. So gut feeling, we're, we're essentially driven to survive and keep out for danger. And gut feeling is our body's physiological response to it. So the two things that you need to experience a gut feeling is to be in the presence of danger. So your body feels that dangerous energy, but also you need the time for your body to process it. When we're behind a screen, you have neither, especially because we're always immediately responding back. You don't get the opportunity to experience a gut feeling that easily. 
So before sexual exploitation happens, there's actually another crime that takes place. And as parents, this is a really good tool to know. This is a really good piece of information to know. So your child does not need to be exploited for you to go forward to the police and for somebody to be charged. If there is someone who is building a relationship or communicating with your child with the intention to take advantage of them later, that in itself is enough. Now, the grooming tactic that these predators use online is they will look at a profile, they'll ask themselves, what need does this particular profile have? And how can I make that promise to meet that need? So for that kid, they're thinking that need, that get that kid needs some self-esteem, their tactic is going to be to love bomb them. If they think that kid is looking for popularity and acceptance, they're going to be um, providing a lot of commentary on their posts. If they think that the kid is trying to be an influencer, then they're going to offer them some kind of a deal from that sense. So this is where it starts to get fun for me. Um, what I'm about to do is give you a behind the scenes into the research that I was a part of this last year. And what I'm going to show you is real screenshots of conversations with predatory people in the community. Before I do that, we have to know exactly what to look out for. So these are the four standard steps of grooming. The first three are very straightforward. The last one, many people would never guess. So the first three is you're online, somebody reaches out to you and builds a connection, either as a love interest, a peer, so someone who, let's say, plays the same sport as you, or a mentor like James Cardino. Then something about your conversation, your kid just naturally would not want to be sharing with their parents. So for example, maybe that person's age or what they're talking about or the platform that they're on. And then within a short span of time, there's a sexual conversation. Now, I know this is not an ideal thing to say. I, I completely understand that. Um, but the reality is that many kids are relying on the digital world to date. Right? They're going on these dating apps. They're, they're trying to find that connection online. Whether it's safe or not, of course, is a whole different story. But with this being done, what's really important is if we tell them, don't do that online, we can't really control that. But what we can do is differentiate for them when that becomes unhealthy. Majority of these predators, almost all of them, will engage in a sexual conversation within the first 48 hours. So what I tell kids is that if you're if you've connected with someone online and months down the road the conversation gets sexual that is different than you've connected with somebody online and within a 48 hour period you're getting those kind of conversations and again this is very foolproof because most of these these predators will be pretty quick to do this and the conversations will look more like questions so they'll start to ask um you know it sounds like you've had a lot of dating experience. How many people have you dated? How far have you gone? Have you dated older? Have you dated younger? What are your preferences? So all this starts to happen in a very short time frame, And then just in the same amount of time frame, you have this one last step that happens. What I will say, I'm sorry, I'm having lozenges. I apologize. What I will say is that this number one sign, if your child knows to block and, and stop responding to somebody who displays this number one sign, they're bound to get rid of and filter out many, many, many of these predatory people. Nine out of 10 times, these predatory accounts will use this one tactic. And it's very subtle and it's called switching platforms. So what this means is that the child has connected with a predator on one platform, let's say Instagram, and then they get asked to add them on a different platform, let's say Snapchat, or they're gaming with them on, um, on Roblox and they get asked to add them on WhatsApp. So it's a switch of one platform to the next. It's incredibly intentional and very subtle. So the purpose is that that predatory person is trying to get a particular type of information out of the child in the most natural way possible. If a child is asked to send photos on Instagram, while some might do it, some might not, because that's just not really what you use Instagram for. But if they get asked to be added on Snapchat, that's just naturally how you use that platform. So without any effort, that predator is going to get those pictures sent in. 
Uh, WhatsApp, for example, if you get asked to go on WhatsApp, it's incredibly encrypted. It's almost impossible to track any person on WhatsApp. And your number is oftentimes associated with your social media accounts. So they're able to actually learn about you without asking you those questions. So this is a really important one. And the acronym that I provide kids is SUS, which in other words means suspicious. <laughs> um, this is a word that they know or a slang that they use oftentimes. So SUS essentially stands for stuff, whether it's modeling gigs, gaming tokens, TikTok rewards, money, any kind of stuff. The U is for unusual age. So if you're under 18, unusual age would be a five year or more age gap. S is for sexual conversations and then the other S for switch. So keeping this acronym in mind, what I'm going to show you right now is myself posing as a 15 year old female and taking screenshots of the people who reached out to me. So this project, the, this research project I was a part of my job was to train web crawlers into detecting online predators and then later traffickers um, in BC online. And so I'm going to walk you through what happens in these conversations. So this person reaches out and says, do you live in the Vancouver area? I say, yes, Richmond, do you? They say, oh yeah, maybe you study at Hugh Boyd because I was also following that page. And I say, oh really, did you go or you went? And they say, no, I'm done studying, LOL. I used to work near this school. I really like the soccer field of your school. Do you play soccer there? Now, I'm not sure if you caught on, but this person researched me before they even said hi. They went into my following list on Instagram. They scrolled through the hundreds of account pages that I was following, found there was one school on there, which so happened to be the husband, my husband's school that he teaches at. And that's how they decided to make their connection. Because what person follows on Instagram a high school that they just work near, right? That they work next to. So they say, I really like the soccer field of your school. Do you play soccer there? I say, yeah, it's not too bad. I just watch, LOL. They go, well, you look like a basketball fan from your shirt. They're looking at my photos. I say, oh, I'm just posing for fun. Haha, <laughs> not into sports much. Then they go, haha, <laughs> that's cute. Do you use Snap, which is Snapchat. So within two minutes, we have that request to switch platforms. And I say that I'm not allowed to add people I don't know on Snapchat. And they go into the same spiel that all of them did with me which was, oh, Snapchat is more private than Instagram. I don't use Instagram a lot, implying that if I want to keep talking to them, I should switch platforms. Uh, there was also the conversations of, oh, it's really difficult to talk on Instagram. I don't really know how to do it. I mean, we're literally, we're, we're literally doing it as we speak, right? So what ends up happening is that in about, this is like a 12 to 24 hour period, I'm not adding them. And the screen goes black now because it is now nighttime. It's evening and that's what my phone does. And um, they actually asked me at this point to go to the movies with them together in person. And I say, they originally told me they're 31, but then they said that they're 26. And I say, are we allowed to do that though? Because of the age difference. And their response is to say, well, it's not like we're dating. We're just watching a movie. And you're almost 16. It's very close. We'll celebrate your birthday in a grand way. Just two months left. And so what do you think they're counting down to? They're counting down to the age of consent, right? So we'll talk about that in a second. These are two other screenshots from two different conversations. This person says, how old are you? I say 15. They say, I thought you were older, you know, the whole, you're mature for your age. Can I be honest with you? They say, I think you're really hot, but there's one problem. I'm 25. They acknowledge it's a problem. However, after this, it got incredibly explicit. They went immediately into, do you like when older people compliment you and so on and so forth. This person on the right-hand side of the screen, after about a day of talking with them, I realized that They've barely told me any information about themselves. So I ask how old they are. They say 30, right? And then they say, coincidentally, you should be 18 years old. Go download WhatsApp, hurry up. So 
again, you have that switch of a platform, acknowledgement of that age difference, um, and that pressure again to, to, to switch, right? And why are we switching? Because it's going to get explicit. If it's not on Instagram, it's going to get explicit on a different platform. So let's talk about the age of consent. So this is also a really great law that you can utilize because it also applies online. And again, nothing needs to have actually happened. Just if somebody is grooming with that intention and there's this age gap, if there's romantic flirting, sexualized conversations, the invitation to meet in person, you can report this to the police. So the age of consent says in Canada, you have to be at least 16 to be able to consent to people who are older than you. So between 16 to 18, you are able to consent to anybody who is 14 or older than you, unless that person is in a position of trust, authority, or power. If you are younger than 16, these are the age gaps. So if you're 12, um, you can say yes to someone who is 12 or 13, and that's it. If you're 13, you can only consent to someone between the ages of 12 to 14. If you're 14, it's between 13 to 18. I don't I don't recommend 18 for 14 year olds, but that's what the law says. If you're 15, 14 to 19. So with these age gaps, what this means is that if your child is talking online with somebody that's older than this age gap, that is that is almost pretty much enough evidence to go forward to the police and get them to look further into that person. And for kids to know as well that this applies digitally as well. And it also applies to their relationship with others in the school. So if you are in, you know, if, if you're 15 or 16, you cannot be flirting with somebody who is 13, or you would then be considered uh, an exploiter, right? So these relationships out of these um, age differences are considered illegal. So we go back to this concept of safety. You know, I'm, I'm behind a screen. I have shared my hobbies. I am flirting. I have shared a photo, but I'm safe because I'm behind the screen. And what we're going to look at right now is a quick video demonstrating how danger is more than just physical. So that was an example of digital blackmail. So what we're referring to that these days is sex extortion. That's the term. And as you'll see here, um, very recently, the Kamloops RCMP was warning that there's this spike in sex extortion scams amongst teens. And we are seeing this amongst every community in BC and all the other provinces. This is a, a new epidemic, essentially. So what you have are these scammers. They go online, they find, they somehow get access to a photo or video that's inappropriate, and they use that as leverage to get money or, photo, um, or more photos or content in return. What we're seeing is, in particular, it's boys that are being targeted. So this 89% 89, 89 increase in sex extortion rates for boys was a statistic that came out two years ago, and it's only gotten worse. In fact, right now, what we're seeing is that out of every 10 cases of sextortion, nine of them will be boys. So I want you to think for a second, what is it about this particular crime, that this particular type of sexual predation that makes boys such perfect prime targets? And if you think about it, many of you might have come up with the idea that, well, we don't typically talk to our boys about staying safe. They feel more resilient when they're online. 
and you would be correct. So because we don't typically socialize boys to believe that they could also be targets, their guard is down more. And the second piece that really helps these sex disorders is that because we don't talk about it often, there's a lot of shame that surrounds boys when they get sex sorted, and they're less likely to come forward for help. And so that also helps the predators get away with this. And these two young boys were sex sorted over the summer, and unfortunately, very soon after, um, end of their lives because of it. And so... We're going to talk about essentially what you can do as a parent to ensure that that shame is not there. And also the tools that we have that can really help kids um, who have been sex sorted. In terms of trends that we're seeing with the boys particularly, it's connecting through Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and then either on Snapchat or on some kind of a live stream platform that they get switched to. They watch as this young, attractive female takes off her clothes and asks them to do the same thing. So they, they do the same thing. And meanwhile, what's actually happened is that they're watching a pre-recorded video being played and the predator has changed his microphone to sound like a female. And they're recording the boy on the other side of the screen. With the girls, it's more of the sugar daddy modeling scam. This is not as common right now because girls are much more aware of this stuff. So for them, it's more of, oh, you're being asked to send a, send a photo um, and, get, and get paid for it. But once you do, that person is actually going to use it as leverage. Hacking Snapchat is not as prominent, but it is happening for kids to know as well that even apps like Snapchat that have something called a for your eyes only folder on it that indicates that this is your private content nobody else can have access to. Even that can be hacked. So it's really that emphasis time and time again, nothing online is temporary. Nothing online is perfectly secure because anybody can record, especially live stream. So who here has heard of the platform Omegle? Raise your hand if you have. Okay, so if you have not, uh, you can ask your kid. I'm pretty sure that they have almost, I'd say almost every single time, 100% of the kids will put their hands up. Um, I unfortunately also looked at Omegle in the research project and I shut the laptop after a minute because when you log on, it's just all types of inappropriate content. It's a live stream platform. It's a live stream website. You just click the check mark that you're 18 and you are automatically connected on webcam with people internationally. Um, and you just keep switching to the next person. And it's very much constantly people who are masturbating or, um, you know, showing themselves or trying to get the, the kid to do the same. So what we're seeing is that there's double the rates of adults on live stream platforms. And so Omegle is the platform. Now there's also something called Omegle Young. And Omegle Young is actually a porn category. So what's happening is that there are predators who are recording the screen when kids are on Omegle and they're taking their clothes off. And then they're uploading the pornography of these kids onto porn websites under the category Omegle Young. And it's actually, it's become this trend now. So Again, it's an emphasis for the kids that nothing online is 100% temporary. It can be recorded. But that being said, there is help. We now have tools and technology that if you keep the photo or video that got exposed or that got sent by the kid, we can almost very likely trace that photo back even from the dark web. So that's something to know. The second thing to know is that there are a lot of laws out there and police are catching on um, much easier on how to track people online, get their IP addresses. If this happens to your child, I can't stress enough that as stressful and shocking as it would be, you have to be the rock for your child because as scared as you are, they are much more frightened. And they're relying and they're depending on you to make sure and reassure them that everything is okay. I would also really suggest that if you're talking to your kids about these kind of things, which you you definitely, uh, and I'll give you um, an example later on on a tangible way to do that. 
to really be mindful of the language that we're using so that we're not naturally creating shame around it. So language such as, I know you would never do this, or please promise me you will never, you know, show your photos online, or you know better than this. So these kind of, this kind of language, while we do want to communicate that it, it's not private, it's, it's dangerous to do it, it's risky to do it. We also want to emphasize that if it happens, they, there's nothing wrong about them. They didn't, they're not being bad. It's not their fault because we don't want them feeling scared to come forward. And we also don't want them being bullies to their peers if their peers have also been sextorted. So if this happens, save everything that you can about the conversation. Do not comply with the threats. Save everything and report it to CyberTip or the RCMP and then report it immediately to your school counselor as well so that they connect with that team. Another really great law to know as well is the child pornography law. So has anybody heard of this law? Raise your hand. Okay. So the child pornography law is a really great tool to know, not just for yourself, but also for your kids. So this law has been around for ages, but it is now also being used on teens. Um, as of maybe, let's say, like 10 years ago, they started to do that and they're doing it more and more. So by law in Canada, if there is a photo or a video of a child who's under 18, if it is nude and or sexual in nature, it's considered child pornography. It doesn't matter if the child consented to it, if they took it, if they're sharing it amongst themselves, that's just what the law says. So if you've taken that photo, you have created child pornography by law. If you've sent it, you've distributed child pornography by law. And if you're keeping it, you're in possession of child pornography by law. All of these are adult criminal charges. So they do not get erased off of your criminal record. Um, it affects your ability to travel. You can be put on the sex offenders registry. So there's a lot of consequences to getting this charge. What we're seeing in Canada is that we put this charge on the kids who have been maliciously sending sex without consent. Um, so for example, there was a girl in Victoria who was dating a boy. She found pictures of his ex-girlfriend on his phone that were inappropriate, and she sent them to the whole school. She got charged with distribution of child pornography. There are situations as well across Canada where kids are sharing other people's sex in folders um, as a bullying type of tactic, and they have been charged with possession of child pornography. However, I've also seen this law be used in situations where a child is innocent. So this has happened actually a number of times. This is not the only the first case that has come forward to us, um, but I'll give you one example. So a couple, a, a boy and a girl, they're dating, and a, 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 you know, one night without him asking for it, she sends him a naked image of herself. So he receives it. He doesn't think anything of it. He keeps it on his phone. And the next day she feels really embarrassed and she regrets doing it. But instead of communicating that to her boyfriend, she tells her parents, her parents panic. They call the police. The police start driving to his house and he has no idea this is happening. They ask to see his phone and that photo is on there. So they charged him with possession of child pornography. Regardless of the fact that he didn't ask for it, he didn't share it with anybody, he wasn't told to delete it. When he went to court, the judge did not approve the charge because, of course, he was not being predatory. However, he still had to go through that process. His parents still had to pay the legal fees. He still had to switch schools. And I'm seeing even situations where couples are dating, they break up. One of them doesn't want their ex to keep the photos that they had sent in the relationship, but they're not on talking terms. So they go to the police and they report it. So it's just important for kids to know that it's to the discretion of the police if they charge. Uh, many times they do because it's a situation with a minor. And even if it doesn't get approved, you still have to go through the court process and you just don't have control over whether somebody else reports that you have a photo. So it's more about making sure that you don't keep anything like that on your phone and also knowing that that law is there to protect you and keep you safe. So if you need help, if you were involved in this, you will not get in trouble. You will not face consequences if you come forward. Some very interesting pieces of information that are, I think, really relieving to hear as a parent. Uh, while there are issues with consent around sexting, first of all, majority of teens do not sext. 
So less than half of teens have sexted or sexed, but of those teens that have, almost half of them had their sex shared again without their consent. 90% of female uh, youth of girls regretted the sex they shared, even ones who were in relationships. So with this issue of consent and sexting, what was also found in this study, and this is, this is very reassuring as a parent, is that knowing the law from a fear-based approach was not effective for teens. However, having conversations with the adults that they trust in their lives, like their parents, was very highly correlated to kids not sharing photos um, with others. So I think that's a really positive thing to hear is that Kids do, even though it doesn't feel like it with some teens, they do very much connect with having a strong set of values and that having those conversations with their parents really does have an impact. So we've talked about sexual predators, we've talked about sex disorders, and then we have this more extreme form of exploiter. And what this exploiter is, is they pose as a boyfriend, they pose as a friend, and they find some way to bring up to light, to bring a conversation around that teen selling their sexual acts or sexual photos online in exchange for money. So I wonder if anybody here, um, and you can type in the chat box, if you know what the term for that kind of person is. Okay, so the terminology for the behavior of somebody profiting off of having someone else make money off of their sexual activity is called a pimp. And when we think of pimp, we have a particular image. Oops, we don't want to start that. We have a particular image in our head. And again, we're going to debunk this stereotype image that we have. So it's just a term, it's a slang term to refer to a certain type of predatory person. And I'll show you what this looks like digitally because almost, I think, I think the statistic was that 50% of um, pimps are now recruiting on Facebook or 50% of trafficking cases were recruited through Facebook. And then a lot of kids are meeting and connecting with people who are pimping online and 50% of them will not even meet their pimp in person um, before agreeing to sell their sexual services online. So this is an example of how this could get started. So to debunk this stereotype that we have and really define people by their behavior, we are going to play the next game, which is actually my favorite game to play with the kids, and that is Catch That Pimp. So I'm going to show you photos of three people, and I want you to guess which one is a real Canadian pimp. So let's see if you can catch that pimp. Okay, so who thinks it's the person on the left? Raise your hand. <laughs> okay. He reminds me a little bit of Hagrid, but yes. <laughs> uh, who thinks it's the person in the middle? Raise your hand. Okay, and who thinks it's the person on the right? Raise your hand. 
a lot of you. Okay. So again, you're actually very similar to what the students vote for as well. And you would be correct. This is Pei Wan. So he's only 20 years old. And what he does as a 20, 20 year old is he goes on Tinder. He swipes right on a 17 year old girl and they match and they start talking and they start dating. At the same time, he is on Snapchat and he starts snapping with a 14 year old girl. They continue the conversation and they also start dating. Over time, he's casually bringing up his ex-girlfriend, their past relationships, his ex-girlfriend, how attractive she was, how he made him look so good, um, how jealous people were about, about him having her. And then eventually he starts talking about, you know, she was so attractive that people would actually pay to go on dates with her while we were dating. And she wouldn't do anything inappropriate with them. She would just go on dates and they would pay for it. And then again, over time, he started to introduce the idea that they could probably do this as well. You know, he would say, you're, you're very attractive. I'm sure that you could also do something like this. And I'd help you organize it because I know how it works now. And these girls almost feeling like they had to prove themselves to him, that they had to prove that they were also attractive and also worthy. They agreed. And of course, this idea of being an escort and just getting paid to go on a date was not the reality of what was happening. So he arranged these so-called dates, but when the girls went and decided to do this is when they were actually confined in a hotel room together with severe violence and they were forced to go and have sexual activity or essentially be raped by these other people. And so by definition, he is a pimp and he was charged with human trafficking. So um, trafficking, human trafficking, by the way, does not need to involve the crossing of borders. It just needs to involve somebody being tricked or forced or coerced or manipulated into selling their sexual services. So Paywon is a pimp. Next one, catch that pimp. So I'll give you a second to look at these photos. So who thinks it's the person on the left? Raise your hand. Who thinks it's the person in the middle? Raise your hand. It's the eyes, isn't it? <laughs> uh, who thinks it's the person on the right? Raise your hand. So again, you're actually very spot on with what the kids guess as well. If you raise your hand, you are correct. They are all local Canadian pimps. The one I do want to talk about is Michael Bannon. So I was actually in court uh, when he was having his case. This photo, he is 29 years old um, when he was charged, but he actually started being a pimp when he was 25 in Ontario, where he used Tinder to swipe and match and form relationships. When he came to the Vancouver area, he set his location settings to the local area that he was, and he would mass message out on Facebook to boys saying, do you want to make some quick, easy cash? And with girls, he would message and say, I'm a photographer. I'm a model agent. I'd love to take a photo shoot of you. And I'll, I'll have, I'll pick you up in a nice limo, which he would actually rent out. Now, all of these kids who would agree to meet with him in person would meet in this really nice hotel lobby. And without them knowing it, their drinks would be spiked. He would then confine them in the hotel room that he had booked and he had already advertised them out to people who sexually abused them. One of his first victims in BC was actually a 15-year-old boy who, after trafficking him a few times, made him go and recruit two of his female friends in the um, at his high school. So again, by definition, he is being a pimp. So there are different types of predators online with different types of intentions and objectives. But what's really great is that regardless of what their intention is, their tactics seem to be the same. And this has been time and time again, it doesn't change. They haven't caught on yet how to change it. Um, but what's really key, especially with us educating our teens around online safety, and I think that this is also relieving for parents. So I don't believe the whole as a parent, you need to know about every single app that's out there and how it works and how it's dangerous. That is completely intangible. It's not realistic, especially now with 
hundreds of apps out there. It's impossible for me to even keep up to date with them. What is effective though as a parent is to know what apps your child is on specifically and understanding how they work. But more than that, being able to tell your kid the red flags of an unhealthy online account. So instead of saying, watch out for predators, don't add people that you don't know. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do security settings. I need to know exactly what you're up to. These things are not as effective. What's effective is for that teen or that child to know if you're online and this friend or follower exhibits these behaviors, this is the, these are the signs of a predatory account. And so we're going to watch a video on that. So we have this video on our website as well, and we do educate uh, and show it to the kids. So if a child takes a photo that is inappropriate of themselves, that in itself is actually not sexual exploitation. But if they exchange it for something like money, for example, then it becomes exploitation. Even if they are consenting by law, they cannot consent. And so what we're seeing right now is that many, many predatory people are not even having to put effort into grooming teens because there's so much self-exploitation out there. And we're going to talk about a few examples um, of what self-exploitation and particular situations and trends are looking like. What I think is important for kids to understand is that healthy relationships with others starts with themselves and that it's important that they step back from the messaging that they're that is bombarding them to recognize that their value is much more than their bodies and their objectification. Because media, especially if you log on, I mean, you just have to scroll through a teen's Instagram or TikTok to see just how much content is there that communicates that their worth and value is of their body and of their sexualization. On TikTok, for example, the more views you get, that 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 a lot of that is connected back to young females who are being provocative on that platform. What's important to, to ask is, well, who does this exchange go to? Who does this behavior truly benefit? Who's on the receiving end? And it's predatory people. One of the trends that we're seeing with self-exploitation is the sugar baby, sugar daddy type relationship. So by the way, um, as alarming as it might be to hear about this, most teens are very much aware of these things. They already are receiving messaging on it. So what's really great is that if you know that they have, and now you understand the issue, you can have those conversations with them. But also when we do education to the kids, we're, we're bringing to light for them this false glamorization of sugar baby and sugar daddy relationships. So sugar baby refers to somebody who's younger that is getting paid to so-called date somebody who's older than them. And the sugar daddy is the older person who is dating the young, who is paying the younger person to date them. On TikTok alone, if you look up the hashtag sugar baby, you will find 1.5 billion views on that hashtag. You can just see it right there. 1.5 billion views on the hashtag sugar baby, just on TikTok. And it's, that's just this one hashtag. There are different types of hashtags around this issue. And what you'll see is so many videos of young girls, some of them are actually minors, they're underage, who are flaunting how they have a sugar daddy, this glamorous lifestyle, they get paid to buy a Starbucks drink and get their nails done. And it's this easy, luxurious life. And kids are being fed this messaging that 
This is a really great way to make quick, easy cash. Uh, you don't have to meet your sugar daddy in person, so it's safe. You're already being objectified, so why not make money off of it? But what's really key here is that they don't have their opinions formulated yet. So if all they're exposed to is this glamorous, false glamorous side of sugar baby, sugar daddy relationships, that's how they're going to formulate their belief system about things like this. But if we talk to them and we provide them with a reality and the ability to critically think, then we can actually debunk this. Oops. So what I like to point out to the kids is, you know, why would somebody become a sugar daddy? Is it that they're lonely or is it that they enjoy the feeling of objectif objectification, of paying to objectify someone? Of, of the feeling of power. And I also like to explain to them that right now there's this messaging that is going out, especially by these girls, where they have taken power over their sexuality, that they're engaging in a mutually beneficial relationship. Both parties get something in return. It is equal. It's transactional. And we point out that, and this is where that critical thinking comes in, right? Where we say, if a sugar daddy, somebody who's older, that is educated, they have their education, they have their career, and they have financial security. And a sugar baby is younger, does not have their education, does not have their career, does not have financial security. These two things are not equal. There is a power imbalance. And if you're the person who is lacking the financial side of things, that's more of a survival need. And so you are not actually the person in control. And there's a lot of dangers around being involved in behaviors like this. And so because of normalization of exploitative relationships, we're now seeing that come to light with many, many websites out there. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone's heard of this one, but again, most of the kids have, even as young as grade eight. Who has heard of OnlyFans? Raise your hand. Okay, so I am willing to bet that most of your kids have heard about it. Um, even some elementary school kids have as well. It's almost a, a running joke on social media. So for those of you who haven't, around the time the pandemic started, OnlyFans came out and their marketing team was brilliant. They came out, they said, we are a website for influencers. And if you're an influencer, you come, you make an account, and then you have your fans subscribe to personalized content of you and they pay for it. Very shortly after, it became a pornography and prostitution platform where people go and they sell <clears throat> photos and videos of themselves for money. Now, just like there's 1.5 billion views on hashtags around sugar babies, you see the same type of popularity and viral posts around OnlyFans. If you are a teen, if you sign on or if you sign up for TikTok, you will come across most likely content about OnlyFans and young women talking about how easy it is that they make money on there. If you're on YouTube, you will get ads from OnlyFans. If you're an adult with that age range, you will not get those same things. And so what I like to point out to the kids and, and for you to know as well is that OnlyFans is not a website, it's a business. And this business, the business owners, they make millions of dollars off of people selling their bodies. And so we think about, well, who is purchased the most? Who is in demand the most? And we start to see the teen porn category year after year for it's now seven years has top porn site searches for adults. The number one porn category adults watch is teens. And child pornography is called one of the fastest growing online businesses. So the people who are in demand are teens and that's and are, are younger, youthful people. And that's who starts to get targeted by these ads. And you also have this false messaging and false promotional uh, content. So OnlyFans claims, even on their website, that the average influencer can make $2,000 a month on average. They did a fact check into this and they found the average influencer only makes $150 a month on average. In fact, only the top 10% of OnlyFans accounts make 90% of all the money that comes in. So it really works like this pyramid scheme. And if you recruit somebody, if you get someone to sign up, you can make a cut of their profits. So it really does function like this pyramid scheme. I've worked with young women who 
were exposed to this idea when they were minors and decided to wait until they were 18, which by the way, in itself is a form of grooming. That's not fully consensual if you were manipulated or coerced or educated or convinced into something like this before 18, right? So when they become 18, they go on there and they decide that they're going to be very smart and safe. And they're only going to upload content of their feet or of themselves without their face in it, no identification. Do you think that they made money? They did not. They're the average Joe Schmo, right? There's so many influencers. There's so much content on that website. Why would people choose your anonymous material? They wouldn't. So instead of deciding that, okay, I'm going to stop here because they've been bought into this idea that anyone can make lots of money. They thought there was something wrong on their end. So they started to push their boundaries until eventually they did expose themselves and they very soon regretted it because this is what we, again, we have to talk to our kids about is that, yes, the, the idea of even $150 for a team sounds like a lot, but that money is temporary. It's transitory. It disappears. You spend it, it's gone. But that photo, that content that you shared, that's now out there forever. It is forever in the property and the hands of somebody that you don't know for the rest of your life and their life. And you have no control over how they use it. So it's really about us facilitating these discussions and the imagery and the details around what the future consequences of this kind of behavior is. So we, we want to kind of break down the reality that they, they will reach their dreams. So the, the concept that, and this is why actually so many kids, once they've been exploited, will continue to stay in their exploitation because they just believe that if they stay in there long enough, they will eventually reach that dream. So we have to break that down for them. We have to get break down that this false concept of safety, just because you're not meeting somebody in person yet, doesn't mean that A, you won't at some point feel like you have a relationship with them and they're trustworthy, but also you don't have control over whether or not they'll use your content against you at some point down the road. We also have to talk about the lifelong impact, right? Because kids are very much in this immediate gratification stage, especially because their brains are not fully developed yet. Their critical thinking is done with their amygdala, which is their emotion-centered part of the brain. They're really looking for that immediate gratification and they need us to facilitate to them what that lifelong impact looks like. And this is, again, just tangible strategies for you as parents. I think that it's very overwhelming to, to just tell parents, talk about your, talk to your kids about this issue, these issues, because how do you bring it up? What do you say? And so a really great strategy is that I strongly recommend go to your Google alerts and you can type in keywords and you can, you can look this up too on how to do this. But if you go to Google alerts and you type in keywords that you want, let's say sexual exploitation, sextortion, online safety, sugar baby, anything like that, you will get news notifications every single day or however often you want. And you can pick out some stories that seem interesting or shocking. And at some point, let's say it's at the dinner table, share it with your kids. You can have current event nights where you share these stories and it allows an opportunity to number one, make these situations that we talk about real because look, this happened to somebody, but also we get to facilitate them into critical thinking about why did this happen? How did it happen? What could this person have done? And we want to use relatable language. So this whole watch out for predators or don't add people who are strangers, that's not the language they're using online. So we want to talk more about this is how I want you to treat somebody whose online account, some, a friend or follower who is behaving with you this way. And if it does happen, come and tell me. And so for you on your end, as parents, when you start to see these behaviors, these are the key indicators that a child is actively being groomed or sexually exploited. So if you see or you hear that they're skipping school or class, their grades are dropping, they're not hanging around their usual friends, they maybe are on dating sites, they've been sex sorted, they all of a sudden have a changed look or they have items they can't afford. This is where we really want to hone in on those conversations around digital wellness. So we open up the space for them to come forward if there is something there where we want to share stories and provide resources and set them up with counseling and a resource right away. We have this on our website. It's in our parent toolkit um, and uh, 
it's free to download. We also have one for children as well. But an online pact is also a really great way to open up a conversation. Essentially, it's putting the expectation on your child that for you to have this, these are the requirements that I ask of you as a parent. And as a parent, these are these are my promises to you. So as a parent, you get to open up that conversation that you will make an effort to learn about the apps they specifically are on, that you will not judge or punish them for sharing their concerns with you, um, especially if a lot of kids don't come forward because they're worried the parents will take away their devices. So if that element is not there, they're much more willing to come forward about it. And I can, I can promise you that if something ever happens to them, they've learned their lesson. They've been scared out of ever doing that again. They don't need their devices taken away. Um, and then on the side of the team, you're putting that expectation that you're not going to transfer platforms. And if somebody does, why don't you just check in with me about it? Um, don't accept any gifts online. So it's it's not so much don't talk to people you don't know. It's more about the behaviors of those people. We have an app that is a free parent tool. It's a free teen tool. It's a free school tool. Um, you can find it through our website, which is on the bottom there, sexualexploitationeducation.com. So what this app does, it doesn't, it's free to download. It doesn't collect information. Essentially, you allow your child, especially if you don't know how to have these conversations with your kids, get your child to download it on their own device and they can explore. This is what it looks like. They can take quizzes on all these different types of sexual exploitation, whether it's extortion or grooming or unhealthy relationships or consent. They can learn about all these different types of topics through engaging content like videos, for example, or engaging posts. They can make goals for themselves to build resiliency. And then they also have access to resources from the palm of their hand. So if you still are not fully comfortable having these conversations, you can tell your kid, hey, you explore this app, I'm going to explore the app, and then you come together and say, do you have any questions for me? And they trust now that you've also familiarized yourself with these kind of this kind of information. Uh, our website also has, you see that resources tab, free downloadable resources, such as the age of consent, child pornography law. I see that somebody asked, and you, and you are correct, um, that is it not now called child sexual abuse material? So yes. Uh, the public is referring to child pornography as child sexual abuse materials. The law has not reflected that yet. Um, so currently the law still is child pornography, but we are hoping that that does change. We also are on social media and our posts are youth friendly. So you can also share your posts uh, with your teens or post them on your story. Um, and, and it engages them in talking about these different types of predators and Tinder and OnlyFans and sugar babies and things like that. So we've talked about a lot <laughs> and I appreciate your participation and, and, and hanging on on this heavy topic, but I hope that you've got taken away some really tangible, uh, practical strategies. And I'm actually going to open it up now for questions. So I'm going to stop the share and we'll just open, open it up here for anybody um, who has any remaining questions. And Deanna, I don't know if anybody had, um, if anybody had chatted to you privately or, okay. No, you can see the comments there in the, in okay. the chat. Okay. Ah, okay. So in terms of the app, and this is why we have it on our website, because it, it is, um, I think on Android, it's more difficult to find. So if you go on our website, under resources, we have the C app, and then you have the direct links to those, whether it's an Android or um, or Apple. So, and I'll, let me just type the here. So this is our website. Uh, yeah, and we have um, and on the app. By the way, the the app is also a web app, so you can go on the app as a website, and it's called the C app dot ca. Which I'll do it here. And it's kind of, it's, it's essentially, you see the quizzes and everything on there. We have the animated videos on there as well um, for your kids to explore. Yeah. Any other? Anna, maybe I will just, oh, did, was somebody trying to? No, it doesn't look like it. Um, Tiana, maybe just um, while people are sort of um, taking all this in, that was a, a lot of information and 
um, I was taking down notes um, so that I can too have some conversations with my kids around this. So I just want to thank you um, for sharing with us your wealth of knowledge. And um, I am just thrilled to have been able to have you here today. And I just want to thank you so very much for sharing all this information with us. Um, and I just do want to remind parents, like, I think I'm going to have to go back and rewatch it again. Um, and maybe with um, my, my two teenagers in the house at the moment. And so we will be putting this up on our, um, on the internet, on, on the school district website. So I'll make sure that that happens. Um, and if anybody has any questions, you can reach out to me uh, through the school district. Um, or of course, I'm sure you can connect with um, Tiana as well um, through her organization. So thank you so very much for this presentation tonight. My pleasure. And uh, I, my apologies again on the the halls that I have, the lozenges and my nose and everything. I'm just getting over something. So I appreciate you bearing with me on that. 